literary diversity. I help plan and coordinate events like these along with a fantastic planning team um, and other team members. I want to welcome you here. I'm so happy to see you all here already conversing and having a very good time. Um, welcome to the Festival of Literary Diversity Writers at the Rose Series presented in partnership with the Rose Theater. Before we begin, I would like to make a land acknowledgement. We are on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded Aboriginal territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and traditional homeland of the Wendat, Anishinaabe, and the Haudenosaunee Nations. As we make this acknowledgement, we are dedicated to continuing to increase our own awareness, understanding, and conscientious action as settlers on this land. Please take a moment to locate the emergency exit nearest to your seat. That would be over there. In the event of an emergency, our volunteer ushers who are positioned throughout the building will guide you safely out of the theater and will meet at the screen in the square. Thank you to the Rose Theater and your amazing staff for having us and to the Canada Arts Council for making captioning available for this event. Once the session is over, I'm going to come back up with a few final housekeeping items. I'd like to start by introducing our moderator, Denise Balkasun, who you may have discovered through her work as a weekly opinion columnist for The Globe and Mail. She previously hosted Color Code, The Globe's award-winning podcast series about race in Canada. She recently took on a new role as executive editor at Chatelaine. Our guest author tonight is Desmond Cole, whose uncompromising and vital role as an award-winning journalist and activist in Toronto has continued to challenge our understanding of race and prejudice in our communities. His book, The Skin We're In, has been described as an essential read that systematically dismantles any lingering illusions of Canada as a beacon of racial benevolence, and a book that will spark a national conversation, influence policy, and inspire activists. Desmond's writing has appeared in the Toronto Star, Toronto Life, The Walrus, Now Magazine, Ethnic Isle, Torontoist, BuzzFeed, and The Ottawa Citizen. He hosts a weekly radio program every Sunday on News Talk 1010. Please join me in welcoming our guests for this evening. from uh, the June chapter of this book. So for those of you who haven't had a chance to uh, see this book or look at the table of contents and know really what it's about, this book is um, an exploration, a documentation of one year um, in the lives of black people in Canada. I would say black Canadians, but not everybody in this book is actually a Canadian, but this is about black people in Canada. And I picked the year 2017 to document. I was kind of experiencing that year while I was writing the book. And so I decided that I would document it live as it was going on. And so every chapter of this book is a month of the year 2017. Uh, there are actually 13 chapters in my year because, there's 13 months I should say in my year, because I decided to add January 2018 to end the book. Um, 
there was a particular struggle that myself and some other uh, folks were involved in around the deportation attempt of a young man named Abdul Abdi. And it was in January that he was taken by border agents, January of 2018. And a really unbelievable series of events that followed all throughout the month of January that eventually led to Abdul being released. Um, my editor and I decided that that would be an appropriate place to end. It's a new year, but it's the same struggle. It's a new year, and it doesn't finish tidily, just like our struggle doesn't ever end, wrap, wrap up nicely and neatly with a year. So uh, I will read you a section um, from the June chapter, and um, it relates to Brampton a little bit, actually. Um, I want to say that the subject matter in this book is at times difficult, is at times troubling, uh, the story that I'm about to share with you uh, is somewhat, not somewhat, it is a troubling story. Many of these are. But these stories are also about resistance. These stories are about not black people necessarily being victimized, but experiencing things and getting together to fight back. So I want to tell you about Black Lives Matter Toronto and their connection to a story um, in Brampton, which some of you may know, and we can maybe talk about that a little later too. Um, On November 26, 2014, I wrote a news report from Ferguson, Missouri, a suburb of St. Louis, where protests continued after 18-year-old Michael Brown was killed by police officer Darren Wilson that August. Wilson had shot Brown six times, including once in the top of his head, after accosting him on a residential street. The day before I arrived in Ferguson to cover the story for the Walrus magazine, a grand jury had decided not to lay any criminal charges against Wilson. Local residents and their supporters, who had been holding sustained and disruptive public demonstrations throughout the three months since Brown's death, were outraged anew by this decision. They occupied the streets of the town, including the space in front of the police station, where police used several acts of local vandalism and looting as an excuse to detain or arrest any black civilian. Night and day, over 2,000 soldiers with the National Guard patrolled the streets of the majority black town. Soldiers with sniper rifles sat perched atop their armored vehicles and took up positions on the roof of the police station, often pointing their rifles at demonstrators. I witnessed police arrest several peaceful demonstrators, none of whom appeared to be doing anything other than standing in the street, as they had been for months. I flopped onto my hotel bed that evening and turned on cable news. I saw that demonstrations for Mike Brown were happening all over the world. In a protest rare for its thighs, thousands of people in downtown Toronto took to the streets, not only in solidarity with the Brown family and the people of Ferguson, but also an acknowledgement of many instances of police violence at home. Demonstrators brought attention to the Peel Regional Police's fatal shooting of Jermaine Carvey in Brampton two months earlier. I was instantly homesick and sad I'd missed that gathering. I was traveling alone and had no one to speak to with in person about what I was witnessing. I didn't realize it was the beginning of a powerful resurgence of black liberation politics and activism in Toronto, a resurgence led by black people of my generation, many of them younger than me. BLMTO, the group born on that day, in the, of, born on the day of the Toronto Solidarity event for Mike Brown, drew upon the collective fake pain we felt for Mike and grounded that pain in our daily experiences as black people in our city and across the city. Okay. 
I'm just going to um, skip ahead. Uh, so uh, what I'm skipping past is a description of Black Lives Matter Toronto then going on to organize for a man named Andrew Loku, who was killed by the Toronto police on July 5th of 2015 in his apartment building. Andrew lived in supported mental health housing in Toronto. And the police, when he was in crisis, nevertheless, came into his apartment and took his life. So BLMTO also had been rallying in support of Andrew Loku. Uh, so um, with Andrew's killing, the black community erupted with grief and rage, and Black Lives Matter Toronto organized. The group interrupted the July meeting of the Toronto Police Services Board to demand the naming of the officers involved in Andrew's death, information that would not be released for nearly two years. They also demanded compensation for Andrew's family and the implementation of a series of recommendations to end police killings of people in emotional distress. Five days later, on July 21st, the SIU announced that it would not lay criminal charges against any Peel regional officers in the killing of Jermaine Carvey. Constable Ryan Reed shot Jermaine three times after a traffic stop in September of 2014. Jermaine was a passenger in the car when Peel police questioned him. The SIU's report noted that although police claimed Jermaine was armed with a knife, SIU investigators didn't find one scene. Instead, an officer from the same police force as Jermaine's killer approached SIU investigators several hours after the killing with a paper bag containing a knife, claiming that a fellow cop had removed the knife from the area. The SIU concluded that the knife had Jermaine's DNA on it. Although the SIU cleared all officers, SIU Director Tony DeParco noted, that the public might understandably doubt the police's story about the knife. Quote, It is highly regrettable that one officer removed the knife from the scene, he wrote. His ill-advised conduct has cast a pall over the integrity of the SIU's investigation. End of quote. Uh, I would be interested in the talk back or question section to talk more about how many people even know this story that took place in this <coughs> city and what it means that we can know the names of people like Mike Brown or Trayvon Martin or Sandra Bland or Eric Garner and not know Jermaine. So that's why I chose that reading. And um, um, maybe people may not also know that Black Lives Matter Toronto was saying the names of people like um, like Jermaine Carvey from the beginning, that that was actually how they started. One of the ways that I find that people try to derail this movement is to try and say, oh, they're just talking about the United States. This is why this book is necessary to document what was really going on and whose lives were actually being spoken about and fought for. So. Sorry. No, it's OK. Are you all right? Yeah, I got a cough. Like yesterday, which is perfect when we've been on stage. Um, so, there are a lot of upsetting things in your book, but one point that you make repeatedly and that you say is important is that something that mainstream media tends not to pay attention to is the care that black communities give to each other, whether it's for ongoing protests or emergency situations, like Jermaine Carvey. And so I was hoping you could talk about what you mean by those examples of community care and why you think we should pay attention to that part too. Well, often what I see happening is that black communities are often afraid to go to institutions for support because we find that those institutions are not caring for us in the way that we need. We're afraid to call the police because things like what happened to Andrew happened, where Andrew was having an argument with his neighbors. Andrew lived beneath neighbors who made noise against him all the time. And what, what would be most needed, I think, in that situation was exactly what happened. Another neighbor heard the argument between two other neighbors. 
came in and diffused the situation herself. And she didn't have a gun. She didn't have a bag. She just used her voice and used her relationship with the people in her own apartment. And she had completely diffused this confrontation between Andrew and his neighbor. And it was when she was standing and talking to him, Robin Hicks was the name of the neighbor, that the police ran up the stairs in Andrew's <coughs> Toronto apartment and shot him. Um, so, that's it. so it's like, what if somebody else mm -hmm. comes, right? What if somebody else in the community can take on that role, can use a relationship with somebody, you know? And we do, we do see this all the time. Like we see black people organizing to raise money for each other for the certain things that happen. We see people supporting each other because like, you know, people can't afford childcare or people can't afford certain things that they need in community. And again, there is either no access, there's no money, so people are always understanding the situations that other black people are in. Immigration situations, where you don't have the right to work in this country even, but other black people around you might take care of you, might give you money for things, might pay for things for your hey, I know somebody who you can work for that's a little bit of a side gig, because how else are you going to survive? You know? And it's important to pay attention to that, instead of just victim type stories. Yeah, I mean, I also think that even the bigger things, Black Lives Matter Toronto's stopping of the Pride Parade, mm -hmm. which is the main action in the chapter that I read from, that's one of the most misunderstood demonstrations, I think, in 21st century Canadian history, if not the most. And the reason I say that is because, uh, well, why not? I won't read explicitly, but I want to have them here in front of me. Well, I can say, so one of their demands was right. the reinstitution of the South Asian stage at Pride, which I don't know how many years it had been taken away, but one of the demands on the Black Lives Matter list was to reinstate that. And to me, that was a very clear example of, you know, it wasn't just about black people, and it wasn't... Not that there would be anything wrong with that, of course. No, it's just more like the the extent of what they wanted for the queer community in Toronto was very broad, and it wasn't one specific thing that got home in on, which of course was no uniform police. Right, and that, that notion that Black Lives Matter said we shouldn't have police with uniforms and guns in a community celebration, not a really crazy idea, by the way. <laughs> um, what's crazy is when people say, I insist on bringing my gun to your party. Yeah. That's actually the, you know, but yes, for the record, the nine demands of Black Lives Matter Toronto when halting the parade. Commit to black queer youth's continued space, funding, and logistical support. Black queer youth is one of the uh, organizations that's been organizing for a couple decades to try and get some of these demands. Self-determination for all community spaces, allowing community full control over hiring, content, and structure of their stages. Full and adequate funding for community stages, including logistical, technical, and personal support. Double the funding for block Orama, which is the largest black queer party inside Pride. Reinstate and make a commitment to increase community stages, including the reinstatement of the South Asian stage. Um, increase the representation among Pride Toronto staffing and hire, hiring, prioritizing black trans women, black queer people, indigenous folk, and others from vulnerable communities. A commitment to more black, deaf, and hearing ASL interpreters for the festival. Number eight is actually removing police floats from Pride. And number nine is a town hall to make sure that all of the demands I just read were actually put into effect. I guarantee you there's people in this room who had no clue about what I just read you. The media didn't just decide to focus on demand number eight. They also decided to frame it in a way that said, these black people, who are, who are only identifying as being black, want to interfere with another marginalized group, queer people's party. So there are no black queer people now who have been fighting this stuff for decades. There's only black people who are mad at all the partying and festivities that the white queer people are having and want to disrupt. And that's how people talked about it in the media. They said, this group, if anybody, should understand what it's like to just want to celebrate, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they do. They're trying. 
And then people said things like they should have meetings. Black queer youth, blackness, yes. These groups were organizing for decades with the petition, with the polite community meeting for the 17th time, with, with all kinds of community interventions to say, can you please listen to us? Can you please pay attention? So stopping the parade was the thing that got every one of the nine demands that I just read to you implemented. But it took that, because all of the quiet, genteel community organizing would not move pride to go. And so yeah, fighting for better sign language interpretation, fighting for the South Asian stage, fighting for indigenous people to be hired at pride. This is the expansiveness of a black liberation struggle that people miss. And I'm sure in some ways it's convenient for them to say that we are only focused on us. But as I say, there wouldn't be anything wrong with black liberation struggle that only focused on us. But we know that freedom is a collective enterprise. That really, truly, none of us are free until all of us are. And that's why I documented that in the book, because that, that work that they did was really for so many more people than it was described to be. Another, another point, you know, as, as you talked about, many Canadians do not know the stories here, but we know so many stories in the other country, as you called it earlier this week, the other country that we're not going to talk about. Do you guys know what other country I'm talking about when so we know we, all the stories from? I kind of referred to it already. So, um, another point that you keep making over and over is that Canada has a history of slavery, and that the criminalization of black people that dates back to then is very clearly linked to the surveillance that we end up with today. Yeah. Part of being one example. So I thought you could talk about that. Again. Well, right. So if I can talk about Jermaine Carvey for a moment, uh, I mentioned here that Jermaine uh, died after the police shot him, and they shot him over a traffic stop that didn't really need to happen. Jermaine was the passenger in a car that was pulled over by a police officer. That police officer later uh, testified to a coroner's inquest that the reason he pulled the car over was to get information on Jermaine. When you're driving in the province of Ontario, you have a legal responsibility to pull the car over if the cops ask you to and to answer questions about your license and registration. They can ask you how your day's going, but you don't have to answer that, right? They can ask you anything they want to besides your license and your registration to prove that you own the vehicle or that you have a reason to drive the vehicle or whatever. If they have an infraction that you're committing while you're driving, they can pull you over. But the person who's in the passenger seat doesn't have any responsibility to those officers. Zero. Legally. Zero. I want to tell everybody that in this room, because some of us in this room are subject to these kinds of practices. And you might not know that Legally speaking, you have a right as a passenger in the car not to give the police your identification nor to answer any questions. I will say that that is not always maybe the most safe feeling thing to do, but the law says that you have the right to do it. Uh, they started asking Jermaine questions when he was pulled over. This is the practice of carding that we're talking about, that officer acknowledging I didn't really have a reason. I just wanted information off of this person. That's the practice of carding that we're talking about that ended up costing Jermaine his life. Because when you're allowed to question a black person over anything, and they say, why are you doing this? The next thing is, oh, the black person was angry. The black person turned aggressive, and we had to draw our weapons. They said that Jermaine had a knife. There was no knife. Um, this is surveillance, right? And it's done to control black people, so that even when they're not doing anything wrong, you can kind of hold them in place. No, you can't go, you're not free to go, you have to wait while we inspect your humanity. And this is actually no different than what would have happened to a black person on this territory 200 years ago. How many people in this room have heard of the Underground Railroad? Probably everyone. How many people know that at the same time as Canada was accepting people from the Underground Railroad who were running here from northern United States, that slavery was still legal in Canada. How many of you knew that? The British Empire didn't outlaw slavery formally until the 1830s, I believe. 
And so there's a really long period of time where these two things, 50 years ago, where these two things were happening at the same time, where black people were crossing over and running away, and literally running away to new places with new slave masters. Some people getting re-enslaved. So in a climate like that, you're walking down the streets of what was then York, what's now Toronto. You're a black person, and you're just strolling. What's, what's going to happen to you? People are going to say, who is that? Why are they walking free? Do you think that that's Tom's boy? You know, there's somebody that we should call. We need to have somebody to call to check who this person is and if they have the right to walk free here. And what do the police call it today? When I say carding, they say, no, it's called what? Street checks. Nothing has changed. The idea that there's a justification for stopping the black people now, but that there wasn't then, Nothing has changed. The same logic that says a black person walking free is dangerous and needs to be checked out from a slavery time in Canada is the same thing that allowed them to stop Jermaine. And after they took Jermaine's life, the officer who did so said that he wouldn't have done anything differently. So life for black people is just as cheap, I'm afraid, now as it was hundreds of years ago during the enslavement. Because people will say they want equality, but they will fight so hard against even one police officer being held to account. Have things changed since the days of the enslavement of black people? Of course they've changed. But the way that white supremacy and capitalism put the chains on us now is just different. Now it's the uh, child welfare system where in Toronto, 40% of the new cases of child welfare uh, cases are black children. In a city that has like 9% of the black children, 9% of the children are black, over 40% of the child welfare cases. Black women are the fastest growing population in the Canadian federal prison system now. Small fraction of the population. We have for-profit prisons in the United States that everybody wants to talk about, but Bell Canada makes money so that people in jail can make collect calls to talk to people and they have I just interviewed somebody last week, Mocha Dawkins. Mocha was in jail, Mocha's story is unbelievable, but Mocha was calling her um, her her mom in Montreal from jail in Toronto. Her mom was racking up three to five hundred dollar bills every month. Because Mocha's only allowed to call collect, not allowed to call to a cell phone. And this is because Bell Canada has a contract in the jail. To provide the service and an exclusive contract. And it gives back to the province. province the province also makes it. Yes, the province gets a kickback from that as well. So the province <laughs> enslaves you once again and then makes money off of the fact that you need to talk to your relatives on the outside. So the tactics have changed, but the anti blackness has not changed. Um, and so I guess the population that I also think of when I think of like a growing women's population in prisons. Um, and the population that has been surveyed since Canada has existed or before would be Indigenous people. And in the book, you're also very careful to say whose territory you're on when you're talking about different places, whether it's Alberta or Nova Scotia or the GTA. Um, and there's, there's a bit of discussion of solidarity movements between black organizers and Indigenous organizers. So I was hoping you could talk a bit about that. And I mean, if people need to know about the surveillance of indigenous people. I mean, the past system is something that I only learned about. Interesting, because it kind of started formally after the Red River Rebellion, in which Métis people uh, were trying to kind of protect their territory from what was the Canada's evolving like federal regime, and they said, you know, Métis people are danger to order, so what we're going to do to control them is we're going to create a pass law system, like a hall monitor card for your, your land. So you can't walk free on your own territory, and this is the connection between the enslavement of black people and all the tactics that were used, and the, co colonial, the colonization of this country, and the, the theft of this country. They use the same tactics on indigenous people. Now you have to have a pass. Well, South Africa 
the apartheid regime, known around the world, was looking for ways to control black people, and they studied the past system that Canada created for indigenous people and said, that's a really effective system. We should use that too. And if you've ever heard of the Sharpsville massacre where dozens of black people who were protesting against a past law system were murdered in the streets, that incident is fighting back against a past law system that Canada created. Um, I talk about um, the indigenous struggle in specific in the July chapter of this book because July 2017 was the celebration of Canada 150. And I remember really well like the week leading up to and leading out of that time and some of the resistance that was happening. Certainly I remember the demonstration, I, I, I catalog it in the book, of the TP ceremony at Parliament Hill when the RCMP tried to stop Anishinaabe people on their own territory from doing the ceremony, can steal more territory that it doesn't own, and potentially threaten all of the wildlife and water in that area. That's how strong your laws in this country are, that's how upright your government is, is that they arrested six people and then released them without charge, just to get them out of the way. Um, so it's still happening. Mm -hmm. I thought Canada 150 and the hypocrisy around that celebration was an important thing to capture. And I think that opportunities for learning and understanding and working together are always there between um, black and indigenous peoples. First of all, there are lots of people who are both black and indigenous, obviously. But then there are also people who identify as one or the other who are facing the same set of outcomes, whether it be in the prison system, whether there be the child welfare issues that we face uh, respectively in this country. And um, I think there are great opportunities to work together, to hear one another, and to engage in solidarity. Because it's not that we understand each other's struggles because we are who we are and they who are. We don't automatically understand. We, we can't through listening. We can through learning and asking questions and <clears throat> reading and thinking and documenting. Uh, another thing that a lot of people don't know was that during Black Lives Matter in Toronto's tent city demonstration for Andrew Loku in early 2016, uh, that, that demonstration lasted 16 days, day and night in front of that police station. But not only did Black Lives Matter Toronto activists hold down that fort, indigenous local activists were there the entire time. They never left, and they were doing ceremony every day, and they were incorporating stuff into the programming that happened. A lot of people don't even know that there was programming happening at Tent City. There were teachings and ha things happening. A lawsuit was filed uh, in the police station while Tent City was raging outside the police. Like, a lot of things actually happened. And it was a real moment of black and indigenous solidarity. And what was interesting, too, was after Tent City was over, a lot of indigenous demonstrators took over INAC offices because they were talking about disparities in services and, and black people who had been at Tent City went to those as well. So I certainly don't think that it is our unique responsibilities as black and or indigenous people to stop these systems. Like all the people who are benefiting from the system, white people, um, it's actually, <laughs> it, it, is, it is actually your responsibility first and foremost to stop this violence because you're benefiting from it. And even if you're not asking to benefit from it, you are. But we do have opportunities as black and indigenous people to engage in that solidarity too. Well, I wanted to talk about solidarity more broadly and between different groups of people. So, you know, you mentioned indigenous people in the book. Uh, you speak to queer liberation struggles. Um, yeah. For myself, in my work as an editor, when I'm assigning things, so more or less I'm going to be assigning stories to women. Um, it has been increasingly important to me over my career to make sure that women is not a monolithic category. Um, and I work hardest to make sure that black women are telling their own stories, that indigenous women are telling their own stories. Um, which I see as an act of, of solidarity and as being a good feminist, to be honest. But sometimes things can be tense or people can feel, you know, afraid, afraid of doing the wrong thing. Sometimes the relationships break down yeah. and things get kind of messy. 
how do we how do we do it better? That's a big question. Yeah, I know. Um, um, when it comes to media specifically, right? I really think like you know my my own experiences in media are also part of the documentation in this book. My my issues around leaving the Toronto Star because you know they wanted a black person's voice um, so long as it wasn't like doing anything effective in the world, right? Um, once you start like changing things and they're like, no, no, shut up, right? We didn't want you to do things. We wanted you to talk about doing things. So we have that big problem in our mainstream media, and. Um, I think that the breakdown in relationships often happen, in my own experience, just due to people being afraid of the truths that, I'll speak for myself, that black people need to share. There is a tendency to want to control us. There is a tendency among non-black people, but also among black people who are given positions in industry as gatekeepers for other black people. <laughs> We're gonna go there. Yeah. Yes. There is a tendency to tell people, like, you need to play the game for your own sake. It's not that I have a problem with what you're saying or doing, but you know, in order to survive in this business, blah 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 blah. I see that a lot, and I think that you're not doing a black person any favor by lecturing them about how to tell their story. You're not saving them from anything. Um, you're saving the industry, and you're saving your boss, and you're saving your newspaper or your publication from maybe criticism, outrage among right readers who are not used to hearing these things straight up. So no favors can be done for us by trying to silence us or water down our stories. I think that's really important. I'm really struggling with this whole representation thing, too. Because, yeah, I want to see black people succeed everywhere. And that includes in the media. But I don't want to see black people furthering discrimination against our community while they have a spot in the media. I don't want to see black people who can only rise up by saying things that are harmful to us, by perpetuating notions that are harmful to us. Um, and. I, I, I feel also like this notion of like, I don't know how to work with you is often itself racist. And I want to call that out too. There's so, so, so one of the tactics that liberal white supremacy likes to use is to be like, we attack you because we don't know you. We're awful to you because we just, we don't have enough familiarity with you. You know what we need is we need some black police officers. Because the black police officer knows the culture of the community and will be able to go in. Now, a police officer only has one job, no matter what their skin color is, right? To protect the state and the property of the wealthy. That's it. That's what all the police do. I don't care what y'all say. Because <laughs> I know everybody's imagining the good cop in their mind right now. But if the good cop wants to do something that is antithetical to the force, He's going to find himself, or she's going to find herself, or they're going to find themselves quickly marginalized within their own police force. And that's how institutions work. Mark Saunders is not the police chief of Toronto because he's pro-black. Yep. It's the exact opposite. Yep. If he was pro-black, he would never become the police chief of Toronto. Yep. So, I just feel like we have to be honest with ourselves that, like, this familiarity argument, this argument that says like we can't cover black people because like they're weird and we don't get them and we don't know them, it leads to really bad things. Because then it's like, I want this black person to tell this story, but I want them to tell it the way I feel comfortable and want them to tell it. Not I just want them to tell the story for what it is. And again, you're just not doing anybody any favors. People who are not black have shown tremendous curiosity in black liberation struggle, and they're not afraid to articulate that 
they think it's valid and they think it's important and they think it's important to write about it. There's a lot of journalists doing incredible work um, talking about us, but uh, I also think that like when a black person is not allowed to tell the story, but it's safer when another POC tells our story, there's also something really messed up going on there too. And I'm seeing a lot of that. I'm seeing a lot of that where now we don't want a really radical black person to tell this story, so let's find another POC who can stand in for blackness, but who's not black, and they'll tell the story instead, and it'll be, everybody will be happier, <laughs> except us. Um, so, since we're talking about media, uh, a theme that comes up as well, and we also talk about Mark Saunders, so black police officers, uh, working from inside an institution or yeah. working from outside an institution. So I thought we could use media as a touchstone for that, since we both work in media and have worked for ma big mainstream orgs and have tried to do our own independent things. Um, you know, the value I see in mainstream is the reach, yep. but I have always hit the ceiling every single time, and it's incredibly frustrating and demoralizing. Um, and then independent, you get to say what you want, but how do you, how do you afford it? So, is it how do you work from within better? Mm -hmm. And who has ideas about how to fund new independent media? Wow. If anyone knows that question, we're, yeah. we're taking it. <laughs> yeah, you have to answer that question in the Q and A if you got it, because I don't. But um, it is really a false choice inside versus outside. I really think it's a false choice. Um, the same way that a person who wants to say end racial profiling can never make it to the top of the police force because the rank and file will not accept somebody who wants to do that. Somebody in the media business who starts at the bottom and who's like, let's smash white supremacy. Newspapers can't even print the word white supremacy. How are they going to smash it? <laughs> so, like... I just think it's naive to pretend that they're going to let a black person with that philosophy rise up the ranks and start controlling decision making, controlling salaries. Absolutely not. However, so um, just for those who may not know this story, and to summarize another story that's documented in the book, I worked for the Toronto Star for about 18 months, starting in late 2015. When the Toronto Star recruited me, I had written a piece called The Skin I'm In about my own experiences of being racially profiled by police. And that piece did very well. And on the strength of that, I got some opportunities to write for The Star, which turned into a, a, a regular column. I was going to say full-time column, but I've never had a full-time job in Canadian media. Um, and that's why when this book makes it to number one, it's going to be real sweet. <laughs> um, I heard that we were number three on the list, actually. Oh, the amazing. Book, and I'm so excited yeah. about that. Yeah, but um, I started writing every week for the Toronto Star in 2015. When I first came to the publication, they put my face on the cover the day I had my first column to like, announce this. Imagine announcing that a freelancer is going to be contributing to your newspaper, but it's a black freelancer who had something of a profile at the time. So they wanted to celebrate this, you know, diversity uh, initiative that was my hiring, I guess. And then I started saying things that they didn't feel comfortable with. So eight months after I had been there, um, John Hondrick, who was the acting publisher at the time, called me up to have lunch. He didn't call me, he called my editor. And if any of y'all work in a hierarchical work environment, which I imagine most of us do, you know that when like somebody five levels above you calls to meet with you, there's something wrong. <laughs> Unless they're about to hire you or offer you like a huge promotion or whatever. And I tried to be optimistic, but I was like, this is probably not why he wants to speak. <laughs> and we went out and we had lunch. So I'm having lunch with the acting publisher of the newspaper. And I don't have a contract. I don't have benefits. I am not protected by the union. I am a freelance contractor. They take my piece every week, and when they feel like saying, goodbye, Desmond, it's been fun, I have no protection. Eight months into the job, he says, let's meet. 
We have lunch, he dawdles for a long time, and he eventually tells me, you're writing too often about race. Why'd you hire me? That's what happens on the inside, is you push, and then they discipline you. Yep. Yes. <laughs> so, if you're going to fight on the inside, push. Don't occupy space and tell us that you're working on it. You being there is not working on it. It's not. It might feel good for you. It might be really even good for your black family. But you're not working on it. And we can't live off of your kind of elevation. Right? This is the problem is that people on the inside, yo, Denise. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know the rest of the story, I ended up leaving the Toronto Star after 18 months because I engaged in a public demonstration. At that time, I was writing once every two weeks now, so they had actually cut my space in half. But, you know, apparently the Toronto Star controls me. So even if I write every, once every two weeks, twice a month, when I go and do a public demonstration in the street, I'm somehow reflecting the newspaper that never even signed a contract with me. While Naomi Klein can be a columnist and an activist at the same time, and Catherine Porter can be a columnist and an activist at the same time. And a full-time employee. And a full-time employee. And Michelle Landsberg, going back decades, can do, all these white women can do activism while being a Toronto Star columnist, lo and behold. But as soon as I did it, they called me into their offices and said, you're breaking the rules of the newspaper. I said, what rule is that? They said, you can't be an activist and a journalist at the same time, that's when you have to pick one. And 48 hours later, I handed in my resignation. Um, thank you. But um, if the union, those insiders that had worked so hard to get what I never got, which was protection and tenure and benefits and all that, if they had spoken out the day that I was uh, putting that letter out to the world saying, this isn't right, what do you think would have happened? What are they on the inside for? You know I adore a lot of my former colleagues at the Star. They're some of the most excellent reporters in this country at that newspaper. I continue to respect the work that they do. Why did they fight for me from the inside? A lot of DMs, though, being like, Desmond, this is horrible. <laughs> Desmond, I can't believe they did this to you. That is the limit. And then the people who get real far, the, the, it seems the deeper you get inside, the less risk you want to take. And you're not doing anybody any favors on the inside unless you're willing to take the same risks. We're out here all swinging on the outside, as it's so-called, just the world. But I feel like people cannot justify their positions on the inside unless they're swinging for the fences. We don't see that enough. Yeah. And then when it's very clear that nobody's listening, it's time to leave. Yeah. Yeah. And I took a big, you know, I had uh, even a lot of black folks who said, like, you know, Desmond, it's too bad you gave up that position. That's the biggest platform you ever had. It was the biggest platform I ever had, by the way. But, um, like, I did take a huge hit. I had to pick, make a big sacrifice. But I didn't want them using my name anymore. It was really like that simple, like how dare you try to, and the irony of it is, I'm giving you away the whole chapter, now. <laughs> but the irony of it is that, like I said, the Toronto Star's reporters have done some brilliant reporting, and they, for 20 years, more than any other newspaper, maybe more than all the other Canadian newspapers combined, have taken the time to show exactly how police carding works, and how it disproportionately affects black people, Indigenous people, Muslim people, people with mental health issues or in crisis. They took the time to get that data. They got sued by the police and they're like, we're still running these stories. So white journalists can make a living off of talking about my oppression, but I can't. That's what hurt. Um, so we are probably over time already. <laughs> but there's one question. I, you can't give a short answer though, can you? <laughs> <laughs> because no, that's why that's I why you don't hold me. But I think it's really important to talk about the idea of abolition, whether prison abolition, police abolition, and just people have no idea what that would look like or what it would 
mean or what it would entail. Is it, how do we imagine it? I how do we imagine it? I did an interview with Matt Galloway on The Current uh, that aired yesterday morning. And we talked about this, and I brought up the idea of police abolition as a way of stopping black people from being killed by the police. And Matt was basically like, but no one's going to go for that. And I was like, but why not? Um, as I said, Robin Hicks, Andrew Loku's neighbor, she shows us how police abolition works. You just don't call the police. <laughs> because they're going to come and they're going to make the situation worse. They're going to try and control a situation that does not need to be controlled. Um, but just not calling them is not enough because they will still in Toronto soak up a billion dollars of your city resources every year. You know, one out of every... <laughs> this is the long answer part. Sorry. <laughs> All I'm trying to say is, like, we can talk more about this, but, um, okay, I, like, I'll, here, here, here's what it means for me. What it is for me is that, like, you, 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 liberal society wants to have its power over us while telling us it's going to use the power for good. Stop pointing a gun in my face and telling me it's for my own good. My dad is a retired mental health nurse. So the same men that the police are so afraid of and so cowardly that they draw their gun, my dad worked in close proximity with people like that all the time and he didn't have a gun. If my dad as a mental health worker even raised his hand, he's gone. My mom is a mental or my mom is a nurse. She still works at a nursing home. Nurses get abused and assaulted every single day. If my mom even raised her hand to somebody who assaults her on the job, she will not leave the building with her nurse's license. Why do all these people who work with vulnerable people every day have to learn how to deal with situations that could be violent, with situations that could be threatening, but they don't have a gun, they don't have a mace, they don't have a taser, they don't have a baton? How are they supposed to defend themselves? Ah. That's what police abolition means. It's like what everybody else besides the police is doing. <laughs> Learning how to solve disputes by using their mind, by using their voice, by using de-escalation tactics, by calling in other people to help calm down the situation. All of us do it. So police abolition is not some obscure, mysterious thing. It's just about not resorting to violence when there is another way. The only reason you call the police is because the police have the legal right to hurt somebody and you don't. There's a six-year-old girl in Mississauga who I talk about in this book who was handcuffed inside her school yeah. by the police. Yeah. Why did those cowardly teachers call the police? Because they wanted to handle that girl, but they know they're going to lose their teaching license. The police won't lose anything if they handle that girl, and we don't even know the names of the officers to this day who committed that crime of assault against that girl, chaining her by her wrists and her ankles inside of a classroom. So... Legalized violence is for protecting the state, and it's protecting the wealthy people's property. That's it. It's not going to save my life as a black person, no matter how many black people work in it. It's not going to save my life, no matter how many new um, diversity co uh, committees or initiatives that they make. <laughs> we have to cut all of that out and we have to start using our minds and start using our voices, start using de-escalation tactics as the rest of the population has to do every single day. I'll stop. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much time we have left for questions. How are we doing this? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little hard to see from the stage just because of the lights, so forgive, forgive us. Oh. Did, did you want to do the question rules, or you want to do it as a... As oh, a yeah, I just wanted to say to everybody really quick that um, I hope that you will ask questions that are based on things that you're feeling in your heart right now. Anybody who wants to know like what my writing process is, there's an interview out there where I've talked about that. Anybody who wants to know how you can be a better ally, God, don't ever ask that question. <laughs> but read the book and do the things that are in the book. Uh, I get these questions a lot, and I'm going to keep getting them on tour, and I just want us to have more of a conversation that's about what you're feeling right now. Uh, Desmond. Yes, sir. 
I've waited 14 and a half years to ask this question of you. So, in 2006, you ran for City Idol, and you won a contest to win a team of people, volunteers, that would help you run for City Council. You ran for City Council. As I observed you, I kept biting my tongue at that, in that year. And I observed that you did not have the tools, nor the vocabulary, nor the pattern recognition to understand how they were screwing you over. <laughs> now that you've written the book, and it's out, and I've gone through it, looking back, when you were looking for a seat at Toronto City Council, which is the white supremacy capitalist patriarchy, <laughs> that is Toronto City Council, um, you still got 750 votes. I did pretty okay. Given who I was running against, I did pretty okay. So now that I believe you do have the tools, oh, I the vocabulary. Okay. I see. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll just bring it back to there's an indigenous thing in the Cree. Um, ask a Cree a question, you will get a story. What is that story now that you understand? I don't, uh, thanks for the question. This is Hemi Syed, by the way, and um, we've known each other since that time in 20, 2006. That's when we met. 2002. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> um, but I don't regret running for office back then. It was like a really good thing for me. And now, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not that interested. Um, I think that uh, the kind of daily stabbing and knifing that somebody of my politics would get in that place if I did win, it, people would come for me. They come for me now, but then I have some more power and some more platform. People are really going to come. And again, this is kind of going back to the inside-outside thing. Could you make a difference? Maybe. But uh, I want to be really clear. The people on the city council who call themselves progressives, who are all white, they don't talk about any of the issues that are in this book, despite the fact that so many of them are falling under the responsibilities of the Toronto City Council. If you don't talk about policing, you're not progressive. I don't even know what, prog forget progressive, like we don't even need that word. Are you pro-black? Like, are you here to defend, to fight, you know? And they're not. And I think it would be a really isolating experience where I would be tied up answering people's phone calls um, where two neighbors are having a dispute about where the roots of the tree run and whose property that they're on. And this black liberation stuff that I'm really on would get um, less attention that I really want to have to give to it right now. The city is going to change when we force it to. Yo, folks, because we've been talking about this, Denise and I were talking yeah. about it on the way here, I am telling you, 2020 is the year. As a Torontonian, this evil and wicked regime of fair inspectors that not a single one of these progressives is bringing up and talking about, watch what we do to them from the outside this year in the game. We're going to mess them up so bad in 2020, and we're going to get rid of this fair inspection regime. And that's the problem, is that even those who have gotten into that position now, who should have liberty as counselors to speak out whenever they want to, if just one of them stepped out of line and said, I don't want this program, all the media would be rushing toward that one dissident voice and being like, why don't you want fair inspection? How about we control the population? Like, they'd freak out. That one person would change the whole conversation, even if the 24 other counselors and the mayor were against them. But nobody wanted to take that risk for black life. Nobody wanted to take that risk for homeless people who are getting jacked up sometimes three or four or five times a day for begging on TTC property. So we're going to do that, and I don't have to be a counselor in order to get that done or to help organize with other people who want to. So that, that's, that's, that's how I feel about that. There's lots of opportunities to do this work uh, from the so-called outside.
Thank you. Who else have we got? Oh. Okay. Um, so I am a teacher. I work in a youth correctional facility. Um, and I've been there for three years, and it's been very difficult to see the injustice that I've seen of the young men that are in there. Extremely intelligent, brilliant young men um, who are in there for serious crimes, but have resulted in coming from a large um, community where they don't have resources and access to uh, opportunities. Um, and it's been really, really frustrating for me to see it firsthand. Um, there's no transition for a lot of the guys who come out of the facility. So when they're released, they're just sent back into their communities, expecting to figure it out, you know, stay away from people who they've been loyal to, um, without any access to programs and opportunities um, that so many other young people have. Um, and uh, this past week, uh, I lost two students to, to gun violence as well, which was devastating. Um, I have got two questions for you. One, um, in my position, I th I'm getting emotionally exhausted, and I know for you, in terms of the things that you've experienced, that you must have experienced that too. So I wanted to know what you do and what you would suggest to um, keep somebody like myself going and keeping that energy. Um, and also, I wanted to know what your perspective was um, with the youth justice system, if you had any experience with it. Um, because I think there's a lot of problems with it. And I think what right now they just want to increase policing and continue to lock uh, young people up. And I think that's the wrong strategy. And um, I know when I'm talking with my husband about it, I'm like, there's just so many things that need to be done within the education system, social services, youth justice. And I feel like I don't know what to do next. Uh, so I'm, I'm at this point where I'm like, I'm just overwhelmed with all these things I want to do to help. And I don't know where to go or what to do next. So. How do you decide? You see so much injustice as well. How do you decide or what do you prioritize as being the most important thing to affect change? And yeah, how do you come up with those kind of strategies? Thank you for sharing all of that. And those are amazing questions. Um, in terms of um, the emotional part of this, uh, the only reason that I'm here is because when I had really dark days, being broke, working on this book, um, I had friends that would cook food and come and bring it and put it in my fridge, or who I could just come and talk to. Um, I had a small community of people. I have my mother. You know, I have people who love me and care for me, and I try to do the same back. And. Um, I think we need to try always to seek out other people around us in our local communities, where we work, who can just take some of that weight and maybe just even just release it off of us for a little time. Do one little thing, an act of kindness or sharing. That's the only way that I've survived and I continue to seek that out because I like I personally need that and I have very dark days and dark moments doing this work. But we all have our moments living it too. So it's like, that's, that's, that's our life and that's our struggle. Um, in terms of trying to figure out how to prioritize what to do, um, I have mostly made my career in the last 10 years through storytelling of one form or another. And I definitely think that activism, that storytelling is central to activism. Communicating a struggle, communicating a challenge. So what I try to do is, I try to focus the majority of my energy on that thing that I have experience with, that I've had some success doing, and when there are other things that might not be in my realm as much, I try to call other people and say, like, what do you think about this? Or do you think that there's anything we can do? Um, I make that mistake sometimes of thinking that because I've been able to be successful sometimes as a journalist, that that means now that I'm other things that I am not. And it makes me sometimes want to take on things that I might not really be even be ready and equipped for. But I know what I'm good at, and I'm trying to, that's like the thing that I can try to offer. Um, 
as long as we're making interventions in the system, even if that's for one person at a time, even if it's one family at a time, I believe that we're doing our work, and I believe that recruiting a bigger core of people so that we don't get tired like this and burnt out like this is the only um, long-term way to make this fight real. Because like, the system throws five things at you for everything that you take off. You know, like the system attacks a black person and then lays criminal charges on the black person. So now, you want to file a complaint against the police, but you can't. Because you have to get these criminal charges cleared from you first, and that's now taking all your energy. So, there almost needs to be like two teams. Like the team and the approach that's going to be like, how do we deal with this immediate thing that you've got going? But then other people and other groups or connected groups that are like, how do we stop the system from laying these charges? And it's that bigger thing that we are always, I feel like, too tired to really go for the bigger. And we're also too uh, small in numbers as black people. If every single black person got together in this country, that's still 3% of the population. So white folks in the audience, I'm not saying these things and I'm not calling out to you because I want to just make you feel something in this auditorium tonight. I'm like, if your children aren't the ones who are being targeted by the teacher, but ours are, I want you to think about that. And I want you to think about how much burden parents in the education system are carrying. How much burden people who have somebody who's incarcerated are carrying that you're maybe not carrying or that your neighbors or your community group or your faith group may not be carrying as much of that burden. What can you do? Because we need the support. We need the resources. We cannot carry this. Black people shouldn't have to carry it all on our own. We shouldn't have to strategize all on our own. So like, but it makes a difference. Like, I truly believe that what you are doing and the little ways that you're intervening, like you have to know that it's enough. Like when you go to sleep at night so that you can close your eyes and go to sleep. Like you have to know that you're doing your best. You know, and I hope you have people around you to tell you and to remind you. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, uh, um, I would like to talk about, hello little brother, how are you? Hey, what's up? So, um, from my perspective, you, you told us we could talk about whatever's in our heart. I feel one looks around here tonight and, you know, um, I was kind of thinking, where are the black people who really need to know a little bit more about their history and about the liberation struggle? And you have a lot of white people here. And, but I know that white people probably are not concerned about the issues that black people have to deal with. Um, they treat their pets better than they treat us in this society. If, you, if you're if you cruel to an animal, you know, it's not, it won't be hard to actually get people convicted. And we have a lot of white people here. I'm questioning what are you doing? This is, it's almost like it's voyeuristic. Um, and particularly, when you have what's happening in Peel in the education system, where Peel, uh, Peel School was under review because of a lot of things, but particularly around black to black racism, and you look at how our children are surveilled in those schools by the white teachers, particularly who are 71% of the population, who, who, um, who hand over our children to the police. Yeah without even calling the parents who tell South Asians who they consider the model, model uh, minorities not to associate with black people. Uh, and you know, you talk about the liberation struggle, that's some, some language that you probably would have thought would have existed during the, the Second World War. And, and when white people say, oh, we don't, know how to, we don't know how to talk to you, we don't know how to we don't know how to deal with the issues of race. It's all a lie, because you know the structures there, the systems there. Their forefathers created it. They're benefiting from it. Um, there's, uh, there's a saying that says, 
um, the fish were the last to discover water, mm. you know, and and you wonder why we have to keep it. You know, it we have to call it what it is. It's this irrational hatred of black people that's keeping us talking about a liberation struggle, a black liberation struggle in the 21st century. And so we would like you, you know, as we're talking about this um, stuff that you're going to do with the TTC, to actually help us here in Peel. Because we are waiting for the recommendations from the minister. Right, about uh, anti-black racism. About anti-black racism. But we are, we are, we are waiting with bated breath. Uh, what is it really going to look like? We don't want recommendations. We want directives. And um, we would like to invite everybody here tonight to come to Pill headquarters at 5650 uh, on uh, Ontario. So when we're actually asking for a moratorium on handcuffing black children on PM, Pill District School Board premises, and so would you help us? I certainly will do whatever I can. But I want to address what you're saying. One of the things that makes white supremacy really powerful is that it's for everyone. Um, and so the black liberation struggle, I think, has to be for everybody, too. I think Fred Hampton knew this, and that's why when he was 21 years old, the state took Fred Hampton's life by running up into his apartment when he was sleeping and murdering him. Because Fred Hampton was a black man who was getting white people to stand in the street and say, I am a revolutionary. And the government was like, oh shit. So white supremacy gives every person a role to play, no matter what their color is. You can serve white supremacy no matter who you are. And so I truly, I don't, I can't divine the reason why any person has come into this hall tonight. But I think what you're saying about the invitation to people to be part of something, that's like very, very key for me, is that those of you who are hearing this and maybe feeling like, why, why is it about my racial identity? Why is it, is a challenge and it's also an invitation, okay? It's both of those things at the same time. Um, and it is true that lots of non-black people benefit from this racial hierarchy by positioning themselves as being a little more easy to work with and sociable and friendly than us. Um, I left the Toronto Star after being told that I write about race too much, and the week after I left, the Toronto Star hired Shripar Carr to be their race and gender columnist. Shree's done a lot of good work, but people are not apparently as threatened by her saying it as other people. And she doesn't say it the way we say it either. No disrespect to her. So I do hear everything that you're saying, Kola. And you know, those of you who struggle by this kind of talk in your presence, understand that it is a challenge and also an invitation. No one is trying to say that to you to push you away, but to make you understand the pain, the urgency, of the struggle and to ask you to respond. So I, I don't live in Peel. I'll try to help out, but there are a lot of people in this room who do live in Peel. And I would love to, for you to be able to connect with Kola afterwards and to ask more, how can I get involved? Even if you don't have kids in the school system or even if your kids are in the school system and they're doing great. All the more reason for you to support some people whose kids may not be having a tough time. about um, abolition and, and domestic policing. And I think, uh, especially for non-black POC, um, getting people to divest and really involves, like you, you were talking about earlier, building that community of care and making sure that we can count on each other and making sure we have each other's backs so we're not always relying on police. But then there's also the flip side where we're having these tough conversations in communities. And I know you've experienced this where you have to hold your own community accountable for anti-blackness, uh, I mean, I'm talking POC right now, or anything that they're perpetuating, and then that creates tensions, which I think kind of starts to break away 
into that care community that you're trying to build, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think that that's a bit of a struggle, so because I think divesting is really the goal, divesting from policing, and also the other goal is to have those tough conversations. So how do you stretch that balance and continue to build, but also continue to push back? So this, thank you so much. This is an excellent question, and one of the chapters in this book is actually about my own struggle with this within my own community. Because there are people within the black community who have risen up these days to kind of um, previously unexplored heights in politics, in the bureaucracy, in social agencies. Black people are getting to places where they haven't been before. Um, it's very actually shameful to me in Canada that it's 2020 and black people are still the first anything. Yeah. What is going on? Why are we celebrating this? It's not that I don't want to celebrate the individual themselves and what they might have accomplished or sacrificed to get there, but we don't ever celebrate the second black person to do anything, I've noticed. So it's like check mark, right? We have one of them now. <laughs> For real. Um, I talk in this book about people, particularly in government, who have gotten into that position now and are acting as gatekeepers. And this is a really big divide within black communities because some people say that, well, that person who's the first, that's a door opening for all of us. So you should not be angry or radical. You should not be embarrassing government officials. You should not be organizing in these disruptive ways. Let's take the slow, steady, progress approach. Now that one person getting in, literally, like, like, like you sometimes don't even hear about the second, because it doesn't happen. Or the one person quits after six months because of how they were treated inside that institution. But there's still a huge struggle internally within the black community in that inside-outside kind of thing again. Um, I don't know how to have really fruitful conversations with black people whose politics diverge greatly from my own on this issue of something like abolition. Because people feel so threatened when you want to sit them down and be like, look, I don't agree with this, this isn't working. Can I give an example quickly? In Halifax, um, early last year, in Black History Month, actually, <laughs> A group called the Federation of Black Canadians, who I talk about in this book, who are one of those agencies that's like, let's work with the government every day. And their idea of working with the government means, let's wait for the government to say to do something, doing something for black people, and then go. And then we'll build a relationship with them. Our relationship will be built on the fact that we are meek, we are pliable to whatever they want, that we won't embarrass them, but at least we'll have a relationship, because black people, what we really need with government is relationships. This is their idea. So they don't fight the government, they don't push the government, they stand behind the government and they applaud all the time, and they call that activism. Um, this federation brought some people to Parliament Hill for Black History Month last year, and while they were there, a security guard came and told a group of the black people that there are too many dark skins in the cafeteria and they have to move. Um, it was a very disappointing, but not really that surprising circumstance. Black people experience this every single day. But there was a big commotion that was caused. Somehow Justin Trudeau got involved in this. This is pre-blackface. <laughs> well, not really. It was just pre us knowing. About Thank you. It was pre us knowing about blackness. Um, I don't know how many Black History Month invitations he got this year, but right. while that day at the Parliament Hill, they were not allowed to bring their phone into the private apology. They were not allowed. It created a huge divide in our community, <laughs> such that when Trudeau came, after the private apology part, there was another part where they were in a cultural center in Halifax and he got to walk around with some people and they got to pose for pictures with them and stuff. 
And there were black people outside demonstrating against Justin Trudeau, being like, we're being carted every day in Halifax, and you're coming here to apologize for this incident on the hill. What are you doing about what happens in our black communities every day? There are people outside demonstrating against Trudeau. And then there were other black people in their Sunday best who were walking past their brothers and sisters to go into that community center. Because maybe there's a funding opportunity here while the Prime Minister and his staff are here. Maybe there's a photo op opportunity. I don't know. And I talked to Lynn Jones, who is one of the elders who was outside demonstrating against Trudeau while her own community members were walking past her. And we talked about this together at a public forum. When you try to talk to other folks and be like, you know, that approach where you welcome this guy who represents these things is hurting us. People get so hurt. They get so mad. They take it personally. And then that rift feels like it's widening. I'm still trying to figure out how to narrow that. How to talk to people about these kinds of disagreements politically that don't push us aside. I will admit, some of it is just that people will never, some people will never be there. They're never going to get to the point where they're like, you know, we need to be community first and we need to leave these politicians to do their thing. Some of them will never get there. But I, w I feel like we need to work very, very hard to find the strategies to welcome people. I think it can be breaking bread and sitting down. Like, I think it can be peace offerings and like community gestures that say, I actually value your time enough to like sit with you in community and have this conversation. Like it can't always be a Twitter call out or a public shaming. I do like those sometimes, <laughs> but it can't always be that. It's it's a hard question that I don't quite know how to answer, but I wanted to share with you my own uh, witnessing of that struggle happening in my community and the fact that a lot of very smart and elder people who are older than me are still struggling to talk to their own comrades and community members who they don't see eye to eye with on some of these things. It's a struggle. But I think that offering friendship and offering like a try to have a conversation in our collective best interest, waiting until our anger has subsided sometimes to have these conversations as well, these are some of the things that I think we can try. All right. Could, could I do, oh, one thing really quickly before we go outside, sure. real quick. I would like to let everybody know um, this book tour is like a great, huge blessing for me. I want to thank all of you guys for being here. I want to thank JL. I want to thank The Fold. Thank you very much, Denise. Thank you, everybody who organized this and made this possible. One of the great privileges of this tour is being able to bring a message to people. And there's certainly a message in this book, but these issues are alive and they are happening every day. I want to share with you very quickly the story of a woman named Santina, who is in Halifax. I want everybody here who has a phone to take out your phone right now. Take it out, right now. And I want you to go on the internet. I know we have free Wi-Fi in the building, but hey, yeah. might use a couple of minutes of your data here. Santina is spelled S-A-N-T-I-N-A. And I want you to type in her name into a Google search with the words change.org. And hopefully, the first thing that is going to come up for you is a petition. If anybody here in this room happens to follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, it is my pinned tweet, this petition on Twitter. If you follow me on Facebook, this is the second to last post that I did on Facebook. Can you guys see what I'm talking about? Would there be somebody in the audience who would volunteer very briefly to just read what's on this petition? It's not long. Yes? On January 15, 2020, multiple police officers inside Halifax, Nova Scotia, Walmart, assaulted Santina Rao, or Rayo. Rayo, in front of her two children after accusing her of stealing groceries. And police and Walmart staff confronted Santina, and she offered that she that they search her and she offered that they search her belongings. Police shifted tactics and asked Rao for her identification. Multiple officers ultimately attacked Santina, broke her ribs, and left her with a concussion and bruises all over her body. The police then laid three criminal charges on Santina, saying she assaulted the police, resisted arrest, and created a disturbance in the Walmart. 
We are beyond tired of the attacks of blacks across, black people across Canada, especially by the police, who have never served and protected black people. We are fed up, of, we are fed up with police forces that apologize for racial profiling but never stop doing it. We have no more patience for politicians who cover for the police and ask for us to wait for the next bogus investigation before we judge them. We therefore demand that the Crown Office in Nova Scotia immediately drop all charges against Santina. The Crown Office investigate and charge all officers involved in the assault on Santina. Walmart Canada immediately lifts its nationwide ban of Santina Rao and compensate her for the violent intervention initiated by its employees. You can read more of the story. In the it relates to everything that we're talking about this evening. I would like you at this moment to sign that petition, and I would like you to use whatever outreach that you have, social media, an email list, or even just talking about this word of mouth. I would like you to spread this petition. This petition went live on Wednesday afternoon. The last time I checked this afternoon, it had over 2,600 signatures, and I have the privilege of being able to take this issue across the country because in a couple of weeks, Santina has to go to court we are demanding that these charges against this mother who was assaulted for stealing groceries while she's still in the store. We're demanding that these charges be thrown out 